There are fewer than 30 men in the world qualified to drive Formula One. A mere half dozen, perhaps, to win. At this moment, I'm inclined to think you're not one of them. Welcome to F1Weekly.com. My name is Clark Rogers. I'm the host of the program. I'll be joined by Nasser Hamid, my co-host. This is podcast number 989, April 24th, 2023, Nasser. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. It's a happy day in Florida. Birds are singing, alligators and crocodiles have no tears because Formula One is here this weekend. Back to you, El Jefe. Thank you, Nasser. On today's program, 30 years since Donington 93, Clio Cup at Monza, Gabriele Torelli wins both races. Dan Kamish takes the double win as well in Donington for the British Touring Car Championship. And what are all the rumors about LCH switching with Leclerc? We've got Fernando dating Taylor Swift. We have a fake Schumacher interview from AI. What in the world is going on out there? This is what happens when there's four weeks without racing. And. I want to mention this week's special interview, Jay Howard of Jay Howard Driver Development. Great interview. Nass will have the details later in the program. I also want to mention the Pacific Coast Dream Machines, cars, planes, motorcycles, trains, and everything else. That's this weekend, folks. April 30th. I will be there. Dan Gentile will be there. We'll see you at the front gate. And I do want to mention one of the more important things is we also need your contributions to keep this program up on the server. Just click on supportf1weekly.com tab right there on the left side of the website. Nass, welcome to the studio. Tell me what is going on in this world. Well, Mr. Rogers, uh, maybe Formula One is right all along. Maybe we should have 30 Formula One races so we don't have people inventing fake news and fake interviews. But here is the good news. On Wednesday of this week, we have driver's press conference. Thursday, we have team principal conference. Friday, practice. Saturday, collie and sprint race. And some people are having a cow about a sprint race also. And Sunday, Sunday, special feature of the weekend. These four days, especially after this long break, will be like a day well spent at Mickey D's. Food, folks, and fun. As you know, they all start with F, and so does Formula One Grand Prix motor racing. I'm loving it. I think when all is said and done, and the race has been won, I think Max will prefer Mayo with his Freedom Fries. And I have a feeling you can confirm this that another driver on the podium would prefer taquitos. Who could that be? What say you, amigo? Well, well, well. Here we go. We're going to Azerbaijan, the temple of motor racing in that part of the world. And yes, I mean, now we've got a tight schedule. After this race, we go to race a week afterwards. So they're afraid that if they have an accident... In the sprint race, there won't be time to fix it for qualifying, or which means you'll also be starting last in the race. Everybody's frightened. If you're driving a Red Bull, you're up front. You're free to fly. It's going to be interesting. I can't wait to get going here because, like you said, we have been going through this weird vortex. I mean, this AI-generated Michael Schumacher interview was mind-blowing. I mean... This AI thing is going to be mind-blowing a lot of people for a while. And Taylor Swift, I mean, she's hot. Fernando's hot. This could be a match made in heaven. 
shake it off. There you go. Now let's talk on the street. Checo might be the hombre in Baku. He has been a good street fighter and hustler, having bo won both in Azerbaijan and Singapore. I think a fully charged and pissed off Max Verstappen will take off on the long Baku straight like a Lockheed F-104 star fighter. Let's just hope there is no done blowed up on the Pirelli Cinturato. Moving on to other players, there's talk on the back street of tension in the Italian Paradiso. Men in Maranello may be at odds with each other. I think this is the least of their problems as they have much bigger fish and scampi to fry in the olive oil. Now according to published reports, Monsieur Frederick Wesser has been given the green light to go on a shopping spree with a blank checkbook and bring in the best available talent. Now bad news on the horizon for Scuderia. According to Christian Horner, Adrian Newey is not taking the 5.30 plane from Milton Keynes to Maranello anytime soon. Question to you. Do you expect Carlito or Charles on the podium in Baku? I do expect Leclerc there. You know, now we're all having doubts about Carlos Sainz Jr. And, and all the bad press that he's been getting is clouding our thoughts and decision making. So I, to be honest with you, I don't know what's going on. But then there's also talk of Leclerc leaving Ferrari, which I don't see happening. But I, I think Sainz is going to be in a very frustrating mode. And he sounds frustrated even when he talks. He talks in a frustrating tone of voice. So I think Carlos needs to go see a Swami or a Mahari. I don't even know how to say it anymore. But he needs to go talk to a Ravi Shankar kind of guy put on some George Harrison music and meditate. And I think Sainz could get through this rough period because he's quick in the Ferrari. We'll see what happens. I'm telling you, all we're talking about, I mean, if you go to autosport.com, the only thing they talk about is Mercedes, LCH, and the updates that they're bringing and all the turmoil at Mercedes. It's their favorite topic. Now, I have to bring up one more thing because it's exciting and it's developing some momentum and that is Felipe Massa he's assembled a legal team that's going to <laughs> we fix 2008 for him so there's a lot of strange things happening I don't know what was going on maybe the planets are lining up Mercury is always in retrograde so keep your eye on the boob tube there's going to be a lot of weird stuff well going back to your comments on Scuderia Ferrari are you trying to say the only way they will wake up is by listening to a snake charmer from Calcutta? <laughs> well, with some Ravi Shankar music in the background, yes. I'm telling you, the snake charmer from Calcutta has a lot of deep, deep good advice. Well, they are already pretty much in the black hole of Calcutta, so maybe the snake charmer from the city can help them. But moving on, uh, you know... I expect uh, two Red Bulls on the podium and the third would be either a green car or the Black Arrow and uh, we'll see how it goes. But I, I will not be surprised if there is some carnage and harem scarum because being a street race and everybody wants to win, there is some tension in the house of Red Bull and Lewis has a lot more points than Russell right now so he would like to keep that momentum going. Now we'll see. And speaking of uh, Lewis, you know, the change has come under Toto's thumb and hopefully LCH will soon have the sweetest and fastest pet in the world as he did in days of yore. Now the good news is heads are not rolling at Mercedes but are being reshuffled. Mercedes have confirmed former technical director James Allison has returned to the position in place of Mike Elliott, who in turn has taken Ellison's role of chief, chief technical officer. And I'm sure Mr. Mike Elliott worked in good faith and his intentions were good, but this zero sight concept, uh, he thought he could get the jump on everybody, but uh, he's lucky it did not cost him his job. Now, Mr. Elliott had been technical director of the team since 2021 when he traded positions with Ellison. And you know, I met James Ellison in uh, Abu Dhabi some years ago at the Grand Prix. He had a brief chat with him. Very nice, friendly chap, I have to say. 
Now, uh, what is happening here? There are some other technical uh, swapping going on at uh, Mercedes. Chief designer John Owen, his position has also been changed. And this guy, Giacomo Tortora, being made the new team engineering director. And I think what's going to happen is that Mr. Ellison is going to stamp his authority. And we will see. I don't think they're going to win in uh, Azerbaijan. But I think this the tide will turn. The Bismarck will start turning now and we'll have a rudder and some power. So let's see how much damage they can do. If they can launch a few torpedoes against uh, Red Bull, time will tell. And sir, good news from your Shang for your Shangri-La. New motivation for French Grand Prix. One hit wonder, ex-Ferrari driver and now president of the Paul Rica circuit at Le Castellet. Our favorite Jean Lacy is very happy about the idea of rotating French Grand Prix with another European race. He said, and I quote, Perhaps now in Europe there will be a new way of having Formula One. It will also help to save money. Maybe Spa or an Austrian Grand Prix or Imola will alternate with us. End quote. Across the Maginot and Manicure line, Dame Deutsche and Folke, there is hope for them that there will be a German Grand Prix in our lifetime, if not every year, every two years. The boss of the Hockenheim brain, Jan Teske, told a German publication, Otto Bild, and I quote, We could only tie up the enormous resources needed to hold a Formula One race every two years whilst retaining the image and status of a Formula One circuit. In that respect, it is absolutely ideal. End quote. And I say, what a shame. We don't have a race in the land of Michael Schumacher and in the land of Juan Manuel Fangio. I guess Baku is more of a destination city than Buenos Aires and Berlin. Just food for thought next time you're riding on the metro. Are you interested in French Grand Prix once every two years, senor? Can you handle that? Yeah, I think it's fine. I mean, I know the French... They're, they're bitching about this. They're bitching about that. They're going to bitch about this. So what can you do? And now, we, you know, we have a lot of protesting. They were, they're protesting at a, a Formula E race where they're not using fossil fuels. So protesters are professionals and they need jobs as well. Okay, next we come to Michelin says no Mars. According to the CEO, Monsieur Florent Menego, or something like that, in a recent interview with The Drive, he said, and I quote, because I would love to see tire wars, but I know that's not going to happen. But I still would like to see Michelin or Goodyear back in Formula 1. But he said, and I quote, The question is, how do we leverage technology to have a good show? And that's where Formula 1 comes into play. Because we have been discussing with them for a very long time, and we are not in agreement. They say to have the show, you have to have tires that destroy themselves. And I think we don't know how to do this, so we cannot agree End quote. I thought Bibendum learned how to do this at the Brickyard in 2005, but that's just my opinion. Michelin, which is based in Clermont-Ferrand, and Clermont-Ferrand is the place where Dr. Marco lost his eye, first came into Formula 1 with radial tires in 1977. Carlos Reutemann driving a Ferrari gave them the first victory in the 1978 Brazilian Grand Prix. They bailed out in 1984 but came back in 2001 and we all know what happened at the Brickyard in 2005. In between, they made another mega contribution to the world of Formula 1, taking Machismo Fernando Alonso to his first Grand Prix win in 2003 on the Steely Dan program. This is the day of the expanding man and tire, which I'm sure you remember very well. Of course, it was a great design, great tire. Hence, Fernando becoming machismo. He let Michael Schumacher in that race. You remember that also. Yes, I still giggle deep down in the bowels. That's good. That's good. And sir, you know, a couple of a few Baku moments that stand out. 2017, Daddy's little Jim Clark gets on the podium. Lance was 18 years old and in race number eight of his young life in the fast and free lane. In this race, LCH and Seb played Let's Get Physical. Honey Badger Daniel Ricciardo led the charge of the Red Bull, winning from 10th on the grid. In 2018, the bullfight between Max and Daniel 
And Daniel later would say, and I quote, As soon as I crashed into him, part of me felt, You guys deserve this. That was a caca show. End quote. And this was the moment that pretty much made him decide to see greener pastures where the heat is not very hot. Now, Azerbaijan is an interesting nation, obviously part of the old USSR, CCCP, as they would call it. Uh, it's known as the Land of Fire, and apparently the world's first oil well was drilled in 1848 in an area called Absheron in the Wildcat Days, and this is the area where Baku is located. And sir, you mentioned the Michael Schumacher situation, uh, which was very insulting, totally needless. It is from fake news to fake interview, but actual firing. The German magazine Die Aktuelle has a front page story and interview with Michael Schumacher. I mean, what the hell they were thinking, especially taking into account how, how private his family is. In fine print, they say it was conducted through artificial intelligence. Needless to say, they got a lot of Stuka dive bombs on this. But I have to say, you know, man, f whether you like him or not, Michael Schumacher brought so much fame and success to his nation. What they did is as classless as Nelson Piquet answering the question, who was a better driver, he or Senna, by saying, I am still alive. And it's no surprise the Schumacher family has already contacted Judge Judy of Germany. And on Friday, the D. Actuels publisher apologized to the Schumacher family and announced the dismissal of editor-in-chief Anne Hoffman. And with the stunt she pulled out, I wonder if she's related to Abby Hoffman. Do you have any two French francs on this situation, sir? Well, you're right. It was insulting. I couldn't believe it, especially from Germany. Those people loved Schumacher. He and what what's really shocking is Schumacher, unlike PK, was always very classy. I mean, don't don't get me wrong, on the track is a different Schumacher. But when he talked to people, uh press if you can get to him, he was always very classy, polite, well brought up, never said anything bad about anybody except for maybe Fernando time to time. But no, it was shocking. I, and I was stunned when I saw that front page of the magazine to actually publish that. I don't know what was going on in that publishing house, but it, I mean, it, it was mind blowing. But yeah, there was a lot of fake news. I mean, when I Google just F1 news because I'm thirsty for any kind of F1 stuff. I mean, it's all over the place. No, you know, you're right. Um, as high profile, as intense, as successful he was, he really did not get down to, you know, the boss gags, dirty lowdown program. I remember in a press conference at Emola, uh, sitting side by side with Montoya, Montoya sa said, you know, they were playing a replay of the RG Bargy, and Michael said he didn't see Montoya and Monta Montoya responded by saying, well, if he didn't see me, he's either stupid or blind. And the guy sitting right next to him and, you know, Michael Schumacher did not say anything or, you know, slapped him or anything like that. And there were many other cases where I was watching some race just a few days ago and there was a coming together with some other driver and he was, you know, he was not PC, but he did not go on a, he did not go ballistic like Montoya or Paul Tracy. So th this was absolutely low class. I mean, you have to ask, wh what was this person thinking? I mean, you're writing about a gentleman who is, you know, obviously cannot operate on his own. I mean, very, very bad. So, uh, well, unfortunately, it takes all kinds to make this world. Yeah, well, when he faces the Judge Judy of Germany, you know what her name is? Don't tell me the middle name is Adolf. <laughs> no, it's no, it's better than that. I think it's. Hi, um, hello. I'm Jean Lizzy, and you are listening F1 Weekly. Gracias. Yeah. Well, I better not say anything more. This gets very complicated. <laughs> it does get very complicated. And trust me, some of this lands on the editing floor. Yes, but I think so far we are okay. I think we're okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, keep up the good work, Nass. Uh, we've got an interview, so stay tuned. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back.
after these brief messages. Hi, I'm Juan Pablo Montoya, and you're listening to F1 Weekly. Welcome back to F1Weekly.com. Clark Rogers here, your host. And now, as I spin the globe and go around the world with Motorsports Mondial and the king, the sultan himself, Nasser Hamid. Thank you, sir. And today we're going to take off for a world tour from the Sebring Airport and uh, a conversation with Mr. Jay Howard, ex-racing driver from England, who is now managing a very successful racing team here in the U.S. Uh, this conversation, which I enjoyed very much because we discussed quite a few things, uh, took place at Sebring a few weeks ago during the Indy Junior Series um, action and i hope our listeners enjoy his story and his team is based in indianapolis area okay folks i'm here in sebring with jay howard jay howard good to meet you how are you today yeah good thank you yeah um yeah weather's holding off uh there was you know uh, supposedly some rain but that's looks like it's going to miss us so all good yeah looking forward to getting underway with usf 2000 rain should remind you of jolly old england yeah, it certainly does. It's, um, I spent a lot of my childhood and racing career, you know, driving in the rain. So um, I personally love the rain, but um, yeah, people over here are not as keen on the on the wet weather as we as us Brits. But uh, yeah, whatever comes, uh, we will be ready for it. Great. Now, England is the centre of world motor racing. How old were you when you got the racing boat? Well, I was, I mean, as a toddler, I know my parents said I used to play with cars on the kitchen floor and the table and race cars and all that good stuff. Uh, I started karting at seven years of age and I would just say really from there I was hooked. Your team is like Prima Racing on this side of the pond in many series and very successful. What is the secret of your team's success? Hard work, dedication. Um, I think for me what makes, oh, which is a big contributing factor is, you know, I've, I try to put myself in the driver's shoes always, you know, as a driver myself, um, just always trying to look, look at it from their perspective and, and um, you know, go th- try, try and remember some of those experiences I went through. Uh, when I was their age and and um, yeah you know desire to win I mean I love this I you know I, I did race in I was passionate about you know love the competition and that hasn't changed just because I've changed my role from you know having a helmet on to no helmet really trying to push my drivers as hard as possible and just no sugar coating just look this is what we need to do this is how we're going to improve this is how we get better and and keep working hard when you push drivers uh, you know drivers are human beings they all come in different format uh, do they all take it positively oh you definitely have to talk to all the drivers differently you have to approach it differently some drivers need an arm around them and a little more confidence building that way some need a foot up their backside and you know need kind of a bit more firing up everyone's a little bit different so that's uh that's part of the process trying to figure out each kid and and what they need so you're not treating them like sir frank williams they're like light bulbs and it can be changed easily <laughs> no definitely not i mean uh you know like i say every driver is a little bit different and yeah we just we try and get the best out of all of them whatever they need we're, we're here to support them among the talent you have developed through this uh, through your team who impressed you the most not only with speed but also with the understanding of the technical setup and feedback it's a very tough question uh, we've had a lot of good drivers obviously you have to kind of look at who's won titles um so rasmussen obviously Lockie hughes yeah those are a couple of guys that have won titles uh, and can back that up so yeah it's it's hard it's and you know obviously just comparing those two guys so for rasmussen he was with us for a long time four years so it's hard to do a direct comparison with Lockie Hughes and Rasmussen when Lockie's kind of halfway through his program. If if we're looking at a four-year program, saying that's an ideal amount of time that you stay with us, yeah, Lockie's only halfway through it. So really hard to do a straight comparison, but they have very uh, similar traits for sure. Okay. 
The cost of racing is through the roof. I understand you need a six-figure budget even in karting. Is there anything that can be done to make this more doable for the common man? It's really tough. You know, things like some of the consumables, like tires and fuel and things like that. Yeah, okay, sure, that can be a little bit cheaper. Inflation in general, right? When you look at what it costs to fly all these guys, the crews pay, um, you know, and when you're always trying to step up the program, make the program better, one of the keys is, well, adding more people, right? If I'm going to strengthen my program now, do I look at hiring another engineer? Okay, sure, I want to do that. If I make that decision, now my budgets just go up. So it's really, it is tough, you know, expenses are what they are. It's just, unfortunately, the nature of the beast. You were very successful in your karting career, both in UK and US. How much did you learn from Mr. Terry Fullerton? Yeah, Terry was great. Big, big influence on my career, my life as well. You know, a short time was with him, learned a lot of things. And there's a lot of things that I learned back then that we apply today. And he was a very... There was no sugarcoating anything with Terry. He told you exactly how it was and exactly what he thought. And I personally thrive on that as a driver. I, you know, if I made a mistake or I didn't do something well enough, I wanted people to tell me. And and um, he's just he, he was great. Did he ever tell stories about his rivalry with Ayrton Senna? He did. Yeah, he talked about it a lot. How he taught Senna, and Senna came in and initially was a bit off pace and was constantly chasing Terry, chasing Terry and and you know Senna got better because he had Terry on the team so it's pretty interesting some of the stories he told me and um, again just uh, Terry's a legend that's, that's it. Yeah. Yeah, I was once talking to Martin Hines and he told me that Terry hardly ever said anything good about any driver but when he raced against Senna he said this guy is good yeah. so that's cool in 2006 you won the Indy Pro Series with uh, victories in Nashville and Kentucky was there any interest from established IndyCar teams for your services at that time? Yeah there's always once you get to that Indy Lights level there's always talk with IndyCar teams um, I was supposed to drive that following year uh, in IndyCar and it kind of fell apart last minute um, so I ended up just doing a little bit more indie lights and then ended up you know, eventually making it into IndyCar. So there's yeah, those IndyCar teams are yeah, they have their eyes on this ladder, they know exactly who's coming through. Yeah, some people will say, Oh, you know, IndyCar team owners, they don't care about the system. That's not true. They're watching. How challenging was the adjustment to oval racing and how big was the excitement of qualifying for your first Indy five hundred? You know, adapted to the oval very quickly. I found a new level of trust because that's what... It, it's a combination of trust and maybe a little stupidity when it comes to ovals because, you know, when you leave the pit lane and you stay full throttle and you just don't lift and trust that the car will go through there. And if it doesn't, it has a moment, you just figure it out. You know, as my wife would say, I'm crazy. But I loved it. It's funny, I, I didn't know what to expect when I did my first oval and I just fell in love with them. I loved especially the high banked oval, side by side, the pack racing in IndyCar. Best memories I have of, of racing. So, you know, going to the 500, I mean, there's just nothing like it. There's, you, you can't describe it. There's, you know, start making hair stand up on my arms just, you know, thinking about it. It's, it's incredible. Um, I'm just really fortunate to be able to have done that. I'm not aware of anything more intense in racing than the last 10 laps of Indy 500. You saw what happened there last year. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how, you know, and we talk about it with te in team meetings and stuff, strategy meetings, and you're just surviving. You know, you're surviving until the end, and then who knows what's going to happen. And, and that, like you say, that intensity just dials up. Get 50 laps out, all of a sudden you're like, okay, we're getting close to the last pit stops. And once those last pit stops roll around, it just that whole place just comes just goes, goes to a new level okay you are now based in carmel indiana in an interview with carmel monthly magazine a couple of years ago you were quoted as saying i look back and wish that i had had someone educating me along the way so that i could have been better prepared and ready for indycar 
What was missing in your young career that you can now give to young drivers racing for your team? Yeah, I think starting early on, understanding the business side of things in terms of finding funding and things like that. I just solely, I, I thought I could solely uh, rely on my ability to drive to get me a full-time ride. And so that was definitely something that was eye-opener. I made some decisions where I went with certain teams that I shouldn't have done. And so having some guidance, someone with some experience that could have said, you know what, we don't need to be going there, we need to go here and just guiding me. Just someone who'd been there and done it and, and knew the industry. Yeah, I was so I was so focused on my personal racing. I, I didn't know the business side. So that's really where things just didn't yeah, could have been a bit smoother. I understand one of the things you like about Carmel, I don't know how much rain they get there, but the town has roundabouts just like Essex, mm -hmm. is that correct? Yes, lots of roundabouts, yeah. I, I definitely have to go through them a little slower here in Carmel than in England. Everyone seems to drive a little faster in England, but uh, yeah, a lot of roundabouts, brings back memories. Okay, so the important question is how good is cup of tea and curry in Carmel? You know what, I've actually found good Indian place that I... I'm absolutely a weekly, uh, is it, normally like Tuesday, Wednesday, I'm normally having uh, a curry, and it's not too bad. England is, for me, the best in the world, in my opinion, uh, for getting curries and, and good Indian food, albeit I've never been, never been to India. I'm sure that's obviously a whole other level, but just in general, travel in the world, um, yeah, can't beat a curry in England, so um, so yeah, I get my fix at least once a week. Yeah. Thank you. Last question about Formula One. I want your take on Max for stopping as a talent, and will Lewis Hamilton get number eight before Alonso gets number three? I think. I don't think Hamilton's going to win another one. I think I think those days are behind him. You know, Russell, in my opinion, is just got the better of him right now, and and Russell is an extreme talent. So uh, you know, look, he's just very, very good, and and has world championships in the future. I think Alonso, you know, I, I mean, hats off to the guy. Just, I mean, just love his approach to it all. He's obviously still got it, and I love seeing him up front, so I hope Alonso gets it. Um, I don't know, those Red Bull cars are on a whole other level right now, so there's got to be some things change in order for anyone else to get a sniff at a world championship, but you never know, and a pretty cool story for Aston Martin and Alonso to, to get a world title. Yeah. And your take on Max as a racing talent? Exceptional. I mean, he's amazing. Um... Probably the most cutthroat driver we've seen in a long time. You can call it selfish and call it what you want, but he's all about him, and and sometimes that works really well. Other times, sometimes not. But yeah, you know, his ability as a racing driver is yeah very, very, very good. Arguably the best we've ever seen. Thank you so much. Real good chatting with you. You're welcome. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Jay, thanks for joining F1 weekly.com Nasser yes sir I have a question for you did you watch your favorite yours and Toto Wolf's favorite series Cleo Cup from I think it was they were in Monza right correct I did watch some of it on YouTube they were in Monza and I was so happy that a fellow Italiano Gabriele Torelli won both races it was very thrilling but there's a lot of good things come out of the Clio Cup. And there's different levels of Clio Cup. There's, And I was talking about the Euro Clio Cup, but you have Italy Clio Cup. I mean, it's a great, great series. And that's why Toto Wolf supports it wholeheartedly. You know, when I was at Monza in 1984, do you remember, of course you remember the Renault 5, right? You mean the one that I used to drive for like 20 years? Yeah, it had a, the turbocharged one. They had a Renault 5 race there. And what was so interesting is the cars uh, being turbo, they were not very loud, but the flames coming out was very impressive. And I was on the back straight, really enjoyed that. And they, do you remember there was a small Alfa Romeo called Alfa Sud? Yep. They had an Alfa Sud race also, which I enjoyed very much. And, you know, this is the beauty of YouTube. You, there was so much racing action going on, Brazilian stock cars. And what I watched was um, 
the Formula Regional Europe by Alpine. This is what Formula Renault Euro Cup used to be. They were in, operating in Mugello and quite a performance from 17 year old driver managed by Nicola Todd. He is from Norway and the name is Martinius Stan Horn. He won the opening race and finished second on Sunday and now leads the championship. You know what is interesting? There is a driver by the name of Camara from Brazil and of course this Kimi Antonelli who's Paisan, part of the Mercedes program. They were the hot favorites and they got, uh, you know, kind of uh, put in the shade by uh, Norwegian Wood. So I have to keep an eye on this guy, Martinez Tenson. And, and he may be the surprise, he's 17 years old, and if he's managed by Nicola Todd, he has to be very quick because he is not going to hire Tatiana Calderon or Milcarduno. Okay, Italian Formula Ford, they were also in action at Mugello. Arvid Lindblad from UK, I think he's half Finnish, half British, hence the name. He is leading the championship after winning one of the four races. There are a lot of cars in this series. McLaren young driver from New York, Ugo Ugochukwu, also won a race and is now third in the championship. Now we go to everybody's favorite race. Formula E on Saturday in Berlin was a case of take my breath away. There were lead changes faster than a NASCAR race. Total of 23 during the race, which saw Jaguar take their first 1-2 in the series. Winner from New Zealand, Mitch Evans, followed by one of our favorites, Sam Bird. One time Sam Bird was also a Mercedes Junior. Third man on the podium was German Maximilian Gunther driving for Maserati. So they are back in single seaters. Graduates from F1's Heartbreak Hotel included Sebastian Buemi, who finished fourth, also in a Jaguar. Pascal Verlein was sixth driving for Porsche. Jean Eric One was seventh for a team owned by Roger Penske's son Jay. Saturday's race 2 was won by Nick Cassidy. He is from New Zealand, top 3 in the championship. Verline leading with 100 points, Cassidy 96, and Jean Eric won third with 81. Okay, sir. And any question, any comment on the Formula E? Well, I, you know, I watched some of the Formula E. It was on television, to be honest, on CBS, which was shocking. I. I'm not excited about Formula E. The sound doesn't get me excited. I think the cars look a little funky. It reminds me of a speedboat from 1968. I'm not sure, but I heard it was exciting. And it was Berlin out in the sticks, but it was still at the old airport, I believe. Yeah. So very exciting. I like the old airport, the buildings and everything. It was very uh, 1950. Yes. The new design is... I'm not too thrilled by the new design of the car, and I really don't watch it. I don't even know what channel it comes on. Uh, but the talent pool is very impressive. They have a lot of, lot of good drivers. So this is not a easy series to win. But we want sound, absolutely. Okay, now moving to WRC Rally Croatia. Toyota winning with Elvin Evans in a Yaris. Ford Puma second with Ot Tanak, and he is from Estonia. And Hyundai of... Esapeka Lapi, he could only be from Finland with a name like that. He was third. In the championship, your Francais, Sebastian Ogier leading with 69 points. Evans, 69, is second. Third is Harry Rovanpera, 68. Now, sir, we come to a segment called Boomerang Boys. Drivers who left the building but came back to answer Andrea's question. Okay, so we will start with Nicky Lauda. The great Austrian walked away from Formula One racing at the 1979 Canadian Grand Prix, saying there are important things in life, more important things in life than going around in circles. At that time, he had won two championships at Ferrari, and he was driving for Bernie Ecclestone's Brabham, and when he told him that he's leaving, he's not going to race. Bernie, being Bernie, asked him to leave his helmet and racing suit behind so he can find another driver. Ron Dennis made an offer Nicky could not refuse and he was back in F1 with McLaren in 1982, winning in only his third start at Long Beach and then asking upon entering the media room in his usual Germanic style. Any questions? With McLaren he won his third and final championship in 1984. 
Then we move to Kimi Raikkonen, man of few words but wonderful talent. He was paid $25 million by Ferrari not to drive for the team, and then they played Baby Come Back and paid him a similar amount. In between, he drove for Lotus. With them, he won the 2012 Abu Dhabi Grand Prix, where the famous comment was made, Leave me alone. He also won the 2013 Australian Grand Prix with the same team. His final Formula 1 victory came in Austin, Texas, driving for Ferrari. Kimi started in Formula 1 with Sauber, and that's where he finished his career in 2021. And you know his kid, Robin, I think he's like 8 or 9 years old and is already in karting, and I think it's only a matter of time before we see him in single-seaters. Hopefully it will happen in our lifetime. Now we come to Shumi, Mishael Schumacher. Stunning and dramatic debut at Spa in 1991 was finger-licking good for Eddie Jordan, but was followed by a delivery of Isaac Hayes Sadie to the team owner on Monday. Do you remember all that brouhaha that happened uh, after the Belgian Grand Prix, how it folded in the media? It was a little bizarre. It, it was mind-blowing. It was absolutely, it was just like Singapore 2008 or one of these strange, strange things. What followed was a fairy tale career at Benetton and Ferrari resulting in what many thought at that time, never to be equal 91 Grand Prix wins and seven championships. Against the wishes of his longtime manager, Willie Weber, the ex-hotel owner who helped Michael check out of the Jordan contract, he signed a contract with Mercedes only to be replaced by a driver who has matched his championship success and has far exceeded his race wins and pole positions. But records are made to be broken. Now someone else is singing. Coming right behind you, sure I'm gonna find you. And if the man has the package, he will surpass both of them. Time will tell. But remember, there's a Ford in his future. Now we come to Alex Zanardi, Alessandro Zanardi. The man with unbelievable fighting spirit was a great success in IndyCar racing. Despite making two attempts in the top tier across the pond, Formula 1 was not kind to him. In 41 starts for four teams, Minardi, Jordan, Lotus and Williams, his best result and only point finish was a sixth place finish in the 1993 Brazilian Grand Prix. Lots of interesting stories in his book, My Swedish Victory, especially about his dad showing up at his uh, first Grand Prix and also some information about Michael Schumacher in their junior days. I highly recommend this book. Now, all rise, machismo. Fa Fernando is faster than the best, and he proved that back-to-back -back in 2005 and six. Since then, he has seen it all, done it all. Rattled by a rookie, machismo at Mulsanne, dynamic in dark car, over 200 miles per hour at the brickyard. Now with Aston Martin, he's trying to be the jolly green giant. Put him in the best car, and he will say, Bye-bye to the best, and that will be the ultimate karma. Now we come to Robert Kubica. The Polish prince was all set to enjoy nights in blue velvet with a red-hot contract from Ferrari, but a serious accident in a rally car put an end to that prancing horse ride. Thanks to Orlen, the Philip 66 of Poland, he came back with Williams, but the thrill was gone and so was the speed. He is still racing in the sports car scene. Now we come to Alan Jones. Jonesy Boy and Keke Rosberg were perfect drivers for Frank Williams and Patrick Head, rough and tumble and taking no prisoners. The Aussie bloke was the first world champion for Team Willie. Few years after retirement, he was offered a deal by Carl Haas to be back in F1. Back in 1978, Jones had won the Canyon Championship with his team. Haas had landed a huge sponsorship deal from a Chicago corporation via Beatrice. One of the men who worked on this project with Alan Jones was a young British engineer by the name of Ross Brown. Sir, do you remember when Haas signed this? I think at that time it was the largest motorsports deal at $50 million where Beatrice was going to uh, sponsor his Formula 1 team and also sponsored IndyCar team where Mario Andretti was the driver. Do you remember those days, senor? Absolutely. Those were very exciting days. Carl Haas kissing the front of the car, the big cigar. Very machismo. 
Yes, and then shortly afterward, um, Beatrice was brought out in a LBO, and of course, and if I remember, it was this Kohlberg Kravis group that brought them out, and of course, very shortly they pulled the plug on the F1 program. Okay, sir, now we come to question of the day. Are we serious here? And this is what I love about, uh, you know, when I talk to young parents, I mean, sorry, parents of young drivers, and they're asking about media and this, whether they race here and that, and, you know, what kind of website they should have. All these things people talk with, so much you can do with social media. You know, my favorite thing to say is always, the best PR is winning races and championship. It's simple as that. But anyway, you've heard of a company called MB Partners, which used to stand for Mark Brundle and Martin Brundle. Martin Brundle has left that building. They put out a press release, and uh, this is about uh, that a team, about the elite driver, and that is Tatiana Calderon. And this is what the press release says. Let me read this to you. You've heard of a thing called fact check, something they do on Fox News quite a bit. One of my favorite things. Yeah, exactly. So this is what we like to do, scratch the surface, as I say, at F1 Weekly. This is what the press release says. Hailing from Colombia, Tatiana Calderon has competed at the top level of motorsport. Now that part is true, but this is where I have a holy cow. Having successfully contested in IndyCar Super Formula, FIA Formula 2, and the FIA World Endurance Championship. Tatiana is set for the 2023 European Le Mans series where she has joined Spanish-based team Virage in LMP2. Now let's look at her immensely successful career. In three years of Formula 3 competition, she has one top five finish. So we're talking about maybe 50, 45, 50 races and one top five. Mm. In three years of, that was Formula 3. Then in three years, GP3 competition, best finish for sixth and no top five. And let me just tell you some simple math. Three years of Formula 3 and three years of GP3. Just here, Mr. Rogers, we're talking about $6 million. Can you imagine investment of $6 million and you cannot even get on the podium? But wait, there's more. In 2019, she raced with Christian Honor's Arden team with no top 10 finish. Okay, now this was in uh, Formula 2. The reward for these percolated performances was a drive in IndyCar racing last year. Not the full season, but several races with AJ Foyt's team. I hear you ask what was her best finished. 15th, 1-5. Now this is the problem with today's PC gone haywire. I guess you can make Porky look pretty with lots of Maybelline. And speaking of corporate America, I think American Express should come out with a new card. The Lucky Sperm Express Card. Privileges start from DOB. Date of birth. Don't leave Colombia or Canada without it. Mr. Rogers, what say you on right buyers with no regard to results? I think it's funny. I mean, the, the problem is, see, you have to get the big picture, and you're not a parent. So when you're a parent, and in today's world, when you go in sports, a lot of time there's no clear winner. Everybody gets a trophy, and you're rewarded not for winning or losing, but for participating. <laughs> so this is the modern PC world. If you participated, you gave it your best shot, hey, here's a trophy. You can drive over at A.J. Foyt's place for a couple of weeks. You know, you can hang out. We just want you to feel good. It, it used to be cutthroat, but this is a little ridiculous. But I don't know. I don't want to be mean to... to Tatiana, I'm sure she's a nice lady. Well, very well said, Mr. Stroll. Gracias. Yes, sir. So um, that's that's where we are. You know what really, uh, what's bad about motor racing now, I, I guess it's always been like this. Now the sport is global, so we talk more on this. But, you know, um, when you see talent like uh, Robert Wickens, who did not make it, very, very bad. You know, Richie Stanaway. Richie Stanaway was one of the most talented young drivers, but he got badly hurt, so that hurt his chances. But Robin Frings is another good racing talent. I mean, you look at jean Eric Wan, that guy is very quick. I mean, he's no slouch. And a lot of these good drivers, they just uh, don't get there because Nicholas Latifi is there and Lance Stroll is there. And I mean, just, just compare uh, uh, Lance Stroll with Oscar Piastri. Night and day difference. 
You know what I'm saying? I do know what you're, know what you're saying. I do know what you're saying, but Piastri blew it. He was almost teammates to Fernando, but everything fell apart. Fernando went to the billionaires, and Piastri went to <laughs> Zach Brown. You know, you're a, you're a fan of machismo, no problem. That What's going on between him and Miss Swift? I, I'm telling you, and he's having a lot of laughs about this, and I'm having a lot of laughs, and I'm jealous. I mean, wow, what, what a machismo. And so Nando says that she has a song that's really about Fernando. So I have to admit, I'm still listening to the Yaman Brothers live at the Fillmore East 1970, so I have not gotten to Taylor Swift's album collection, but I'll get there eventually. So I'm a little naive to her music, but I know she's hot, and, and Fernando's hot. So this is a, a match made in the media, and it's wonderful. You know, Alban Brothers also wrote a song about uh, Fernando Alonso. It was called One Way Out. Really? Are you sure it's not Whipping Post? No, that was for Max Mosley. Bravo! Wow. Uh, okay, sir, so looking forward, um, this uh, Friday I am flying out to Sweet Home, Alabama, where the sky is blue and the governor is, uh, tr you know, true. But the track is absolutely beautiful. So I'm going there. Hopefully we'll be able to get some interviews. Um, I don't want to take any names, but I've reached out to a couple of few teams. Shockingly, nobody has responded. I guess we are nothing in IndyCar racing. But anyway, I'm going to show up and ask some people, uh, IndyCars or Formula. I mean, Indy Lights is also there. So hopefully we'll come back. Uh, if nothing, I will try to get an interview with Parnelli Jones's grandson, Jagger Jones. He's racing in Indy Lights. Actually, he's teammate to our friend, Mr. Inam Hemad who will also be there. So we'll see what we can do. And sir, now time has come for your favorite question. Who's going to win um, Azerbaijan after Fernando Alonso takes the checkered flag first? Well, you're right. Fernando will win in Azerbaijan simply because of the chaos. And Checo is going to have a couple of habanero peppers in his breakfast burrito that morning. And I'm going to tell you, dude, he is going to be hot on it. He doesn't want to hear about Max. He just wants to win, win, win and become world champion. And in that heated moment, literally, he will take out Max. Fernando will say, thank you, bye-bye. And there you have it. It'll be LCHP2 and Sainz on the podium. Yeah, that's what it will take. And I have a very strong feeling that Alonso will win a race this year. I mean, it, he has to. It, it was just like when Ricciardo went to uh, McLaren. It was, it was, it was going to happen one way or the other. So let's see what happens. Okay, sir. Um, we're pretty much up done with the time now. We are, sir. We are. We're wrapping it up and and getting all the fundamentals ready for this nice race weekend. Yes. So now we come to fame. Before we go to musical body, we come to famous last word from Gunther Steiner. By the way, have you read his book? No, I've not read his book, and I checked the mail. Gunther has not sent me his book, so I was very disappointed. It looks like I might have to actually purchase it myself. Yeah, I have also not read it. And uh, anyway, he said, and I quote, You have to work hard for envy. You get pity for free. End quote. What do you make of this guy? I know he's become a rock star, superstar, and I don't have any beef or axe to grind with him. But I think, you know, based on the results of the team, they did a very good first season. But since then, you know, it has become a case of, apart from his beautiful language and, you know, profanity that he uses, I think it's more of a case of much ado about nothing. What say you? He has an interesting tone and a way to grab the media's attention by his one-liners, his sound bites, his accent, and he's sort of a funny guy. And I like his to-the-point critiques of people. He doesn't mess around. He's not PC. And in this PC world, we need more Gunther Steiners. So I will buy his book. I always agree with him. And his assessment of Hulkenberg and Magnussen is spot on. So I'm a Gunther fan. As a matter of fact, my dog's name is Gunther. 
And you're right. He is very straightforward to the point. It's like the Kimi Raikkonen situation. He's not going to BS you on any question you ask. But man, he does have a real uh, sauerkraut with Mick Schumacher. He just can't let go of that, and which I'm very surprised. Have you noticed that? I have noticed. And if you look at him, there is a little chip on his shoulder. He stole my chip? <laughs> yes, the, the chip has been transferred. Yeah, mine had guacamole on it. His one, I think, has sour cream on it. Yeah, whatever works. You know, I want him to be happy. Yeah, same here. Okay, sir, now we come to musical Montreal, and um, looks like it's still very cold in certain parts of the world. So we take this opportunity to invite Mr. Chris Ria to the palatial studios for a little looking for summer. Thank you for listening. Please enjoy. 